All right, look at this. Here we are, one service here today. We all grab our seats. I think we're just so happy to see each other all in one in, in one uh, service together. I think some of you think that half the congregation left. Well, there's some evidence that no, that did not happen. And here we are gathering together for worship again. I was just thinking of Psalm 103 this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. And it is so renewing, so refreshing. Uh, to be together as one um, worship service again. Uh, it is joy to my heart uh, to be gathered up like this. And I want to thank you for being here, for bringing that joy to my heart. And I just pray that as we're gathered together, it's encouragement to your heart and soul together uh, to be together as well. So um, let's pray that we know the joy of Christ and as we experience that together. It's, you've been so patient over this last year plus. And, and God has really blessed and directed us. And, and we're thankful for his kindness to us over this past time. So, so it is good. This is our first service back together in person. We know that there still are people online. And so we are glad that you could join us. We're going to continue that for uh, the time being. And we're just glad that you could worship uh, with us as well today. Um, if you are visiting with us, I'm Sean Whitenack. I'm one of the pastors here. And you'll notice on the back of your bulletin, there's a place for you to introduce yourself to us. Please let us know that you're here. Uh, we'll have an offering in a little bit. And you could just... Uh, take a minute right now to fill it out. You can put it inside the offering plate as it comes by in just a little bit today. And if you're online, there's an online guest book, there's an online bulletin, as well as a place to give online. And so I encourage you to uh, take advantage of those links uh, for yourself today. Um, I do have a few announcements this morning. Um, as we get started, first of all, you are welcome back to our evening service. We'd love to have you come worship with us. Paul Hepperly uh, will be preaching and, con and uh, doing a, a study on the, the life of Samson tonight. So I encourage you to come to that. Our youth group will be meeting as normal at 430 today. So we invite all of our youth to come and be part of that. Um, you'll see inside of your bulletin a number of inserts. Uh, one of them describes our current and upcoming Sunday school classes. You'll see one side has children and the other side has adults. Next week is a new Sunday school quarter, so we'll have some new classes for adults. Um, well, two of them, Instruments in Redeemer's Hands, uh, a class on, on uh, personal ministry, like counseling sort of ministry with one another, uh, led by Pastor Sam, and I'll be doing a membership class starting June 13th back in my office, which is in the back corner. So uh, if, if you'd like to uh, know about membership in New Life in Christ Church, we'd love to have you. On the other side, it has some of our plans for children in Sunday school. We are still working to reopen our classes, and so there's just a process we're working through uh, to get there. Um, you'll also see uh, interest on a men's retreat. I'm going to save the dates. There's also a women's study coming up very soon. And so, ladies, we do invite you to come be part of this uh, Bible study that will be held on Wednesday mornings. And um, you'll also see an insert for our Vacation Bible School, which reminds me to invite uh, Julie Root and, and Jennifer Warman up for an announcement this morning, a VBS announcement. Can you feel the energy? You'll feel it here in a minute if you don't. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's at the evening service. That's e Sorry. Yep, that's my joke. Hey, good morning, church family. I'm Julie Root. And I'm Jennifer Warman. Uh, and we're up here to give you an update on uh, our VBS coming up in July. Uh, before we go any further, let me just get my glasses on here. There we go. So. so do you know what our theme is this year? I do. Mystery Island. Yes, and speaking of islands, do you know what island is in the shape of a square? Cuba. Yes. <laughs> but I bet you can't tell me what island is the coldest. Bermuda. <laughs> well, if we're taking a trip to Mystery Island, do you think we'll run into any, like, pirates or anything? <gasps> There's a strong possibility of it. <laughs> So, speaking of pirates, you know they have a favorite letter of the alphabet. Do you know what it is? The letter R. Yes. <laughs> and they can't seem to learn the whole alphabet. Do you know why? Because they spend years at sea. 
<laughs> uh, so if we'll be at Mystery Island, we'll be surrounded by the sea and sea creatures. Mm -hmm. And do you know what sea creature happens to be the richest sea creature? A goldfish. Yes. <laughs> and do you happen to know who won the sea rodeo last year? The sea horse. <laughs> yes. And the last question's a tough one. Do you know how clams communicate? Do you know how they talk to each Why other? Why on their shell phones, of Very course. good, very good. Well, Jen, you sailed right through those. You get a starfish. <laughs> So, well, you know, every year our VBS needs lots of wonderful volunteers, and many of you have been so faithful in helping us in the past, and we're so thankful. Um, this year we still have some openings, um, some spots to fill, and we need your help at whatever capacity you're able. Uh, please consider signing up. We have a blue folder in today's bulletin. Um, you can sign that, uh, fill that out, and put it in the offering plate, or you can speak directly to us. Uh, and Jen, can you just share a little bit about maybe some uh, details on how COVID will yes. affect us this year? No, absolutely. We'll be sure to do our best to follow all recommendations and procedures about sanitizing and distancing and food preparation. But we also want to encourage former VBS um, students to go ahead. And if you have aged out this year, we invite you to go ahead and join us on our volunteer team. Um, and then we can go ahead and keep you involved and you can sort of sail on in that direction. Yes. <laughs> also, we do have flyers in the foyer. We're going to be doing a Facebook post later as well as probably an introductory email. So look, be on the lookout for those things. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we can, you can get in touch with us, with us at a, spe a special VBS email. Uh, we set up a VBS at newlifeinchristchurch.org. Um, and again, we'll have Facebook pages, um, updates, and registration will begin at June 14th for children ages five through sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, so we look forward to our adventures yes. together on Mystery Island this July 12th through the 16th. Yep, and we look forward to see you all there. Yes, let's sail away now. All right, yeah, so mark those days out, uh, July 12th through the 16th for Vacation Bible School for you and your neighbors. Invite them to come as well. Well, as we begin our service today, we're reminded of God's word and his call uh, for us as we gather. Uh, Isaiah 40 says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exalted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We just pray that as we gather together, that you'd be encouraged in the Lord, encouraged for the call that God has before you. Let's ask the Lord to prepare our hearts as our choir begins our service this morning.
the Lord has spoken. Amen? All right, so remember these things? They're called hymn books, so we're going to be in hymn number 12. Now, we will be in a little bit of a transition. You'll see it up on the screen. As long as we're doing a live stream, we'll probably be doing both. And so, but we do encourage over the long term, we're headed back here. And so just encourage you to stand, open a hymn book, and uh, sing hymn number 12. But it'll be on the screen as well. Please pray with me. Father, as we just sung, we exalt your name. We praise you forever. We're so thankful, Father, that we are here together as one people again. After 14 months of the pandemic, we are finally together. Father, I pray, in a sense, you draw us up to heaven in our worship. And I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts to the message that uh, you have for us today. And everything that we do in this service would glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When 
the time in our service where we have our corporate confession and this morning our corporate confession is one of thankfulness and when we think of the awesome magnitude of God's forgiveness the extent to which Christ has gone to atone for us that just reveals the terrible gravity you know of our sin and our response to that should be you know thankfulness so we're going to read this together and so please uh, pray with me almighty God father of all mercies we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us, 
and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your unmeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving ourselves up to your service and by walking before you in holiness, righteousness in all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And our assurance is found in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated.
let the amen be heard from his people again. Great is his faithfulness that he has shepherded us through these past months and enabled us to join together our hearts in worship and in praise together as his people, as, as one Christian family. And I, I can't express my gratitude to the Lord and to each one of you for being here on this Lord's Day uh, for our, our, our leaders, Pastor Sean and Pastor Sam and the elders for guiding us through this past year. Thank you so much. And we do rejoice in the Lord's kindness toward us. Um, it is a special joy to have with us uh, Michael and Casey Warman, and they have a new son, Riley, and if you'd be willing to come and present him to the Lord and, and to claim his promises for your son, and uh, Jacob also. I mean, you're such a big boy. You know, we do praise God for his covenant, that what binds us together is the, is the blood of Christ, which we claim for our salvation. And he binds us together through our covenant together. And he has made wonderful promises to us, you know, promises in, in baptism. So it's a um, particular joy to celebrate this moment with you, Michael and Casey. It was just a few years ago, it seems like, that I uh, had the privilege of performing your marriage ceremony. And I don't know, you told me, but I've forgotten six. Yeah, almost seven. Almost seven years ago. And, uh, and it's such a joy to see you maturing in Christ and had opportunity to baptize uh, Michael few years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, and now uh, your son. And so I'm grateful for that. But we see what, uh, what our pro Lord has promised to us in Acts chapter 2, when on the day of Pentecost, having pronounced that Jesus Christ, or proclaimed that Jesus Christ was resurrected and now seated at the Father's right hand. Uh, and so Peter says, Wait a minute. I, I need to let you introduce him, don't I? Um, th this is Riley, uh, Oliver, Warman, and, and I'll have, while, while I'm reading and all, I'll, I'll. And so P Peter proclaims, therefore, let all the house of Israel know that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brothers, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And notice that it's, it's a single promise, but there's two aspects to it. That you see forgiveness of sins, you know, through the blood of Christ, and also the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and this promise is not only for you, but it is for uh, your sons. And uh, this morning we claim this promise, or you claim this promise for, well, we claim it too, for, uh, for uh, Riley. And so it is a wonderful privilege that God has made these promises to us. Um, we don't believe that baptism saves anyone, um, but is a sign and a seal that points away from itself to Christ and to the promises made to us in Christ Jesus. And so it's a sign of uh, God's cleansing and forgiveness, and it is also uh, a seal to seal to us the ministry of the Holy Spirit in a mysterious way that I couldn't begin to understand. But uh, but we know that God is faithful, 
and we do rejoice in his faithfulness. And we are thankful um, for his work in your lives and uh, to, to draw you to himself and now for your, your vows. So we, we are thankful for this sign and this seal. So uh, let me ask you some questions, if I might, that uh, uh, Michael and Casey, do you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and the final authority in your life? Do you? Um, are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, not in any works that you can do, but only in the work of Christ? Do you? Um, do you believe that you can live a life that is God honoring and pleasing to him and turn from whatever uh, is displeasing to God to a life that is pleasing to him? Do you? And believing these promises, do you believe the Lord has called you to this particular congregation and, be, and are you willing to be submissive to the, the pattern of authority that the Lord has given to us from his word and um, believing that it will be to your spiritual benefit and encouragement, do you? Yes. And now with regard to, to Riley, do you believe that although Riley has been born sinful and separated from God, that nonetheless God has promised to save him and that the means that he will primarily use is your Christian home, do you? Okay, good. And uh, um, are you willing to set a godly example before Riley? Are you willing to pray with and for him to raise him in the nurture and discipline of the Lord and minister the hope of the gospel, trusting that God will give to him the gift of faith in his own time? Do you? Yes. And since last time you took this vow, uh, have you made a, uh, a sincere effort to honor that vow. Yes. Okay, thank you. Maybe if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay. Believe in God's promises, do baptize you. Riley Oliver Woman, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son that you sent into this cruel world to suffer from the moment he was conceived in, in brought into this world to suffer throughout his life, but particularly to suffer uh, upon the cross for our sin, to uh, rise again. Uh, well, first of all, he lived a righteous life on our part, our part, on our part, and died unjustly on the cross, but yet to pay the penalty of our sins and satisfy divine justice. And now you've resurrected him from the dead and ascended him to the right hand of the Father. And it is uh, in Jesus' name that we do uh, baptize um, in the promises of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the promise that uh, the gift of forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit is um, signed, that this sign points to you, and it's the only way that Riley can ever know you is, is through uh, the triune Savior, and we just commit him into your hand, claiming the promises of God that this uh, gift is not only uh, to his parents, to Michael and Casey, but I just praise God that it's for him as well. And I do pray that you would indeed work by your Holy Spirit to call him to yourself and work through their Christian family. And thank you so much for them and this, for this privilege that we have uh, to rejoice in, in your faithfulness to the generations. And we just do praise you and thank you now for these promises and do pray that you would Minister your grace in Jesus' name. Amen.
do celebrate the faithfulness of our God to us. We celebrate his mercies and his love, but grateful that it's not just to us alone, but that we get to share it together with, uh, with other brothers and sisters. And so I'm particularly grateful for each of you this morning. And we, we do celebrate our opportunity to work together. Um, and we do thank you and praise you for our dear pastors and Pastor Sam, uh, who's on vacation this week, and Sean, Pastor Sean and Julie and their family as they'll be leaving on vacation. And we pray the Lord's blessing upon you and that the Lord would renew your strength and encourage you during this time. Uh, Pastor Sean, um, we are thankful for your adapting to the new schedule. I'm so very, very grateful for the opportunity for us to gather together. We do pray for our high school graduates. We do pray for our vacation Bible school. And as you can see, the enthusiasm of Julia Root and Jennifer Warman, we're so very, very thankful for, for your service and ministry and your enthusiasm. And we are praying for you and for Lisa. Uh, here, I'll just pray for these other things rather than repeat them. And, uh, and I especially want to pray for you, Eric and Sarah. And please pray with me. Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you for the mercies that you've shown to us in Christ Jesus that are new to us every single day. I thank you and praise you for this privilege for us to gather in your name and pray that you please uh, encourage each heart and each one. We thank you and praise you for uh, the blessings of our pastors and please renew their strength uh, even as they have this time with their families. And we just pray that you'd encourage uh, each both Pastor Shaw and Pastor Sam. We do thank you and praise you for uh, uh, our Vacation Bible School. We commit Julie and Jennifer into your hand and their leadership and that you provide the needs that are there for Elisa Wasson. We do pray that you please minister your grace to her and, and to her doctors as they discern you know, how to treat her. We pray that you please be with our missionaries, Matt and Carly Chase in Japan and uh, Paul and Marty Clark in uh, Peru. Uh, you know, I do cry out to you for the peace of Jerusalem, that the gospel would be powerful in Jerusalem and the surrounding regions, and that you call people from all the different uh, nationalities to you. And we do pray for, especially for healing between the Jewish people and the Arab peoples in the region. We do pray for our own General Assembly and that you would work through, that you'd be with them as they work through the, the questions that uh, need to be answered from your word and by your spirit that you would discipline and disciple our, our, uh, the church as a whole and that you would glorify your name through it. Now, Father, we do grieve with uh, Eric and Sarah Schrader. We do grieve with them, uh, but not as those who, who are without hope, but their hope is in you and I thank you for how you've comforted them, but I pray for continuing strength and comfort for them. I pray that you please uh, uh, minister to Sarah especially so there's no complications in her recovery and healing. And Father, we do especially rejoice in this uh, weekend and in, in the day tomorrow to remember those who've served our nation so faithfully and diligently. We do thank you and praise you for each one in our own congregation that has served in the United States military and defended our freedoms. And we just thank you and praise you for them, pray that you bless them and we're so grateful for their sacrifices and their service to our country and to us as well. And we just commit them into your hand and care. Now, Father, we pray that you'd be with the rest of this service, be with Pastor Sean as he ministers your word. And we pray, Father, that you'd keep us united in Christ, hoping in him. Help us not to become complacent now that the seeming threat of the ep epidemic is, is over. We just pray that you'd not allow us um, to go back into just thinking that we can handle life. We cannot handle life without you. We repent of our self-sufficiency, thinking that we can handle the situations of life because the truth is we cannot. We are dependent upon you. And so we do cast ourselves upon you this morning, praying that you please uh, minister your grace. And we do cry out to you for our nation. We don't know how our nation can survive with the divisions and the, and the hatreds and antagonisms 
that only the gospel of Jesus Christ can bring us together. So we do pray for a great revival in our region, in our community, in our nation and world. And we pray, Father, that you'd unite us in Christ as a nation. And we just do thank you and praise you now that you are the God of hope. Fill us with joy and peace and believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And uh, we are thankful for our ushers and ask them if they would come. And as we sing the doxology to receive the offering. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Please stand up. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Sink. We're a little out of sync. I'm sorry about that. But you, you can go ahead and take the offer. You can be seated, yeah. <laughs> Because we love it. and praise to our God. Praise God from
Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, these gifts, these offerings, Father, they are a gift uh, to you. You give us all things. You've been so generous. And we're thankful for uh, the principle of giving as worship. Uh, Father, it's a response to your grace. It's a response to your kindness. Father, we know we don't earn or deserve anything that comes in these things. But, Father, it's a response to your love and kindness to us. And so, God, receive these for the building of your kingdom. God, uh, the spread of the gospel through the nations. We ask you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, while you're standing, why don't you take out your Bibles and turn to uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to today read, uh, we're going to focus on verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. It's a very appropriate place to come as we come back together. Pastor Doug alluded to this in his sermon, or in his prayer, that this isn't a time of complacency now that, hey, here it is, we're back together. No, really, it's a chance for us to say these things are being put behind us, but let's not lose track of what the mission is ahead of us. And that's where we want to look at. And what better way to look ahead than the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so that's what we're going to see talked about in this passage here. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 15.1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then, it is, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is God's word. May I add his blessing to the reading of it. You may be seated. And would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we come to this precious word of the gospel, and we pray, God, that as the Apostle Paul wanted to remind them of it, as you wrote this, that you would remind us of this gospel, that if there is those who don't know the gospel, that it would become clear. And Father, for those of us who do know it, that we'd be refreshed in it. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for your word you've given to us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been said that if the only tool that you have is a hammer, then everything that you have looks like a nail. And I think that's a good explanation of how we, uh, many of us, try to address our, our problems. Uh, we face difficult circumstances or we, um, you know, get into conflict with somebody and, and we reach into our tool belt and, and we look for what's available there and we just find that hammer. Might be the hammer of anxiety. It raises up our, our concerns and sends us frantic or it might become that hammer of anger. The hammer, hammer of lust, when we look at these problems, we pull out that hammer and we address it that way. doesn't matter if we have screws to tighten or, or boards to cut, that we're committed just to using that one. And if we're trying to fix the problems that we have with that hammer, it's not working because it's the wrong tool for the job. Well, that's a bit of an introduction to our passage because as we've been studying over this last, since September, these last nine months or so, We've gone from 1 Corinthians 1 to 1 Corinthians 14, and we have seen so many of the problems within the Corinthian church. Um, it may, you know, we see this level of dysfunction that's there. It's, it, it, it's kind of crazy sometimes to think of the things that people are dealing with, but it might have been some comfort because we can realize that the problems that we have and the problems that churches face, um, these things are not totally new. Some of the things which they were dealing with at their time that people have been dealing with ever since. Divisions, conflicts, disruptive sin, elitism, disregard of the needy, arguments within the church. I mean, I can say that any of these things may appear in any church at any time. 
It's a picture of life in this fallen world, even among God's people. Because even though uh, the church is those who've been redeemed by Jesus Christ, uh, we still have the residual effects of sin upon us. And we know uh, that we need to constantly uh, dwell in that grace that we've been shown. We want to be shaped by him. We want to grow in him. All right, so now we move into chapter 15. And we see the church dealing with one more issue. Now this time it's a little bit more theological, and this time it's a little bit more historical. Now with the previous 14 chapters, he's been dealing with practical issues inside the church, and then he takes these practical issues and he gives a practical answer, or a theological answer. You know, practical problems, but let's look at the theology behind it, let's give some practical answers to that. But here we deal with a theological problem and it has a theological answer that's needed. And the challenge is about the resurrection of Jesus. If you look down into verse 12, you can see the thing that they are dealing with. Verse 12, that there were some in their church who were questioning whether there was a resurrection. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, we read, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I believe that of all the problems that they face, this one might be the key to all the other ones. Sometimes I wonder if it's the most important. If doubting that at this issue was the root of so many of the other problems that they were facing. We had this beautiful, we had this beautiful dogwood tree on, on our property and it was a tree my kids loved to climb and every spring these beautiful uh, white flowers would come out on it, and over the last couple of years, I've noticed that it's dying. It might be a branch here, a branch there, uh, but this year, I think it's finally done. Barely has any leaves on it at all, and even though I could pull a branch off here and there, is that it didn't fix the problem because the problem was in the trunk. The problem was in the roots, and no matter how much I tried to do outward things, there was no possibility of fixing it if, if the root problem wasn't solved. In the same way, that the Corinthians, they deal with all these other issues that are going on. If the roots are left sick, they're going to be left with the problems that are there. It's a matter of the gospel. It's where he goes to. But it's the same thing for us. We can try to fix all these problems that we have inside of, of our life, but if we do it without getting at the roots of, of what our greatest needs are, is that uh, we're not going to find the solutions that, that we need. The world doesn't help us really in this aspect. The world, first of all, tells us there's no spiritual reality, and so if you're going to look for answers, you're not going to look in a spiritual way. It says that we are purely material beings. Uh, what we need to do, according to the world, is, is uh, find the right material uh, fix to our body. It, it, it might be uh, doing physical things, getting a different environment, taking certain medications, but addressing these outward symptoms of our life, but not addressing the inward spiritual matters and the upward spiritual matters. When that doesn't work to bring about a real change, the world encourages us to blame others, to blame our bodies, blame our environment. Uh, we are who we are because others have made us that way. While there's no doubt that the things that others do do affect us and affect us even deeply and personally, these things you know, can be embraced in such a way that we give up our moral agency, we give up our responsibility, and that leaves us without hope. And the ones that works through that usually tells us, well, there's something wrong with you. If you would do right, then everything would work out right. You've created your own problem, you need to work out of it. Now, with the amount of mistakes that we've made, how can we get things right for the future? Is it already set? Well, the weakness of every one of these things that the world may tell us is that it limits our abilities um, to ourselves or to our environment. You know, it, it's calling us really to dig ourselves out of the problem ourselves, to dig us out of the problem ourselves. And it limits us in what we can do. But God has laid out another tool. And this is where we get back to this idea of tool. He's given us another source for the power of living, and he's given us the gospel. It's the very starting point for dealing uh, with our problems. And the very starting point is our own relationship with God. So the Apostle Paul, he's the one who wrote this letter to the Corinthian church, and he finishes it here in this second to last chapter by explaining the gospel. And, and you can see him in verse 1, getting back to the 
to the core truths when he says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. He needs to remind them. He needs to remind them because it should be at the center of their church life, should be at the center of solving their problems, should be at the center of their hope, and need to be central for them, and it also needs to be central for us as well. And so today, what we want to do is to look at what the gospel is and why it's so important in solving our problems. The first thing that we see in verses 1 through 4 is that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. I bring up this question, why did they need a a reminder of it? Apparently, they had forgotten it. They had set it aside, maybe to focus on other things. Maybe they were so wrapped up in their conflicts that they'd forgotten this core truth for their lives. It's easy for uh, Christians, especially, to think that the gospel is something that we need to to start the Christian life. But once we get started in it, once we kind of know these core things, is we think that we can move on to more important things, right? Things like apologetics, defending the faith, you know, making a strong case for, 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 for Christianity or worship. You know, we, we need to get to that praise service and get that done rightly or, or church growth. How do we have more and more people uh, come into our church services or, or, or social causes, you know, to think how we can help those who are in need or, or missions, you know, let us reach the world or discipleship, you know, let's grow in our faith. But we can never ever forget the gospel. All all those things are important. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the gospel. And so here he is. He's uh, talking to believing Christians, and he knows he needs to remind them of this, of this gospel, especially in light of all their conflicts, all of their problems. We never outgrow it. We never move past it. It never becomes old hat. No, it's something that we actually move deeper into. If you think about babies growing up and, and their need of food, you know, they need uh, food. They move from milk to food so they can keep growing and move into that full potential. And once they're adults, you know, just because they've, they've had food that's got them to the full size, it's not like they need to stop eating, that they can stop eating food. No, they keep needing it. Every one of us needs it to keep going on. And the gospel, we start in it. And we keep it in. We go into it better and deeper. Now, what is the gospel? The gospel, the word, uh, technically means good news. In Greek, it's euangelion, which is, again, good news. But the good news of what? What is this news about? We see in verse 2 that that good news is the good news of salvation. He says that this gospel is by which you are being saved. And he goes on then in verses 3 and 4 to write out this core content of it. Let's look at this. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. First thing I want to point out that he deals with is the issue of sin. Now, sin is something that the world may not want to talk about. It sounds repressive to say, you know, can't I do what I want to do? And, and how dare that you say the things that I want to do or, or the things that are doing are somehow transcendently, transcendentally wrong inside of the eyes of God. The world wants to say that we're not accountable to anyone. We can do what we want. We can do what makes us happy, right? But sin is this major theme inside of the Bible. We need to talk about it. This sin, is it does affect people's lives. It affects um, relationships, it, reflect, it creates conflict, but most of all, it affects that relationship with our Creator who's created us to know and to walk with Him. It affects our relationship with Him, but it also affects our own consciences. Every one of us here knows that we've fallen short of what we think that we're supposed to do, and, and whatever that standard is, is that we know that we haven't done it all. The Bible, again, is clear that sin is a transgression before God, it's a sin, that's, it's something that's deserving of punishment. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. It's a separation from God. It's coming under his judgment. We've broken his law. We've done things that, he, that we shouldn't do, things that he's told us not to do, and there's other things that he's told us to do, which, which, which we haven't done either. And because of those things, we're liable to God's judgment and, and ultimately to hell itself. And that's our biggest problem. 
That's our biggest problem, being born into this world. Without dealing with that broken relationship with God, you know, what hope do we have to deal with our broken relationship with others? Or even our broken um, relationship with ourselves? See, that's the one that affects the way we relate to God, to others, even inside of ourselves. Now, verse 3 shows that God had a plan to rescue sinners. It says this, it says that he, he died according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. It means that God promised and even planned the way that Jesus would die. We could go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, right in the very beginning of the Bible, thousands of years before Jesus came and died, and we see this first promise of the Bible, of, of, of a Savior. In this uh, passage, uh, in Genesis 3, 15, God is speaking to the devil, and he, he, tells the devil, he tells the devil he's going to have this conflict with the offspring of the woman. That's a reference to Jesus. It's this promise that the devil may hurt the offspring by bruising his, his heel, but just before his own head is, is bruised or even crushed. So this is one of these, these uh, forecasting, these prophecies of what Jesus was going to do. And this came thousands of years before Jesus came. Ever since sin entered the world, God had a plan to rescue his people. Right at the beginning. And he revealed that more over time, um, he showed that his suffering servant would suffer for the sins of his people. And so we, we could look at Isaiah uh, chapter 53. Words that were spoken some uh, 700 years before Jesus came. And we speak about uh, who he was and what he was going to do. Where it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 700 years before Jesus came, it speaks about his coming. Jesus is the fulfillment of, of these two and many, many more of Old Testament prophecies that said he was going to come. It's because it was planned by God. Notice that uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 also says he died for sins. He died for sinners. You know, how, how did he die for sinners? It means that he was a substitute for us. He took our place. We're the ones who were supposed to die, but, but he, he stepped in, he took the wrath of God for us. You can see um, in the sidebars in, in your bulletin, I, I listed the, the children's catechism because it really says what the atonement is in very simple words. What is the atonement? It's Christ satisfying God's justice by suffering and death as a substitute for sinners. This justice which we were owed, this justice which God uh, should have shown us is that Jesus Christ suffered on a cross, dying upon that cross in order to pay that penalty for us. It's taken away from us. It's taken away from God's people and put instead upon Jesus Christ. He's a stand-in for that. And not everybody's always comfortable with this idea. They might say, that doesn't seem fair. People should get what they deserve. You know, I can't get 100 on my test and say, hey, apply it over to, to that girl over there. You can't... Um, you look at somebody else, you know, and we bring our, our, our very low um, credit rating and say, hey, use his credit rating instead of mine in order to get the loan that I want. You know, we have that sense that, uh, you know, people should get what they deserve. But God doesn't deal with us in the justice. If it was up to justice, we would only get punishment. But because God deals with us with grace and with mercy, uh, he gives hope. Jesus Die for our sins. He, he takes them away. We don't get what we deserve. He said we get his, his love. We can think of even that word atonement. And you just spell it out. And you can see that we, it's at one meant. A-T at one meant. We're at one with God. That sacrifice that made us at one with God because it's, it's taken the offense away. We have peace. Romans 5, 6 says that while, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It goes on in verse 4, in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, to show that God accepted the sacrifice upon the cross. And it shows us how. 
He did it by raising him from the dead. Again, this was also part of God's plan. We could read Psalm 1610, where it's a prophecy of, of staying, again, hundreds of years before Jesus came, that he wouldn't stay in the grave. It says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And corruption is that decay of the body in the grave. He raised Jesus from the dead, showing that that payment was done, that it truly was finished when he died upon the cross, that there was no more penalty that needed to be paid, and that you, by believing in Jesus Christ, have eternal life. That's something we need. Something we need to start in eternal life, and it's something that we need to continue in eternal life. I mean, it is a starting point. And so if you are here and you are not a Christian, I mean, this is the core message of the Bible, and you need this message for yourself. You need to see your sin. You need to see the judgment that you stand under, under God's holy law. You need to see that Jesus died for sinners and receive that gift then for yourself. Something you need. So receive it. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Ask him to forgive your sins and commit yourself to following him by faith. But if you're already a Christian, notice what he says in verse 1. Again, we'll go back to verse 1. He says, this is the gospel in which you stand. It has daily relevance. Something we hold fast to according to verse 2. It's not something we graduate from in order to go to something else. We don't graduate from the gospel. Know that we always live the gospel. If you graduate from high school, you just don't forget the lessons you learn, but again, you build on the things that you learn. You keep learning that, using that basic knowledge, you go in deeper in your career, in your college, uh, whatever it is. One person has said that the gospel is not the diving board to get into the pool, uh, but it is actually the pool itself. It's what we swim in. It's what we wade in. And the Corinthians, their biggest problem throughout the letter is that they're finding their identity in something other than the gospel. And as they forgot about the gospel, they drifted uh, farther and farther away uh, from it, farther and farther away from um, each other, and they ended up in bigger and bigger conflicts. So I hope that as you are here, that you have not forgotten. But it's a daily and regular encouragement to you. And that when you're tempted to, to bash somebody over the head because they've upset you, that you remember that Christ has forgiven your sins and, and you can forgive somebody else's sins. Or that when circumstances come up, instead of responding with anxiety, that you remember the gospel, that Jesus Christ has taken care of your greatest need. He's taken care of your eternal destiny. And so you don't have to approach that with, with anxiety. But you can trust him and move forward by faith. Or that when discouragement comes in, and you think that you failed just again, and you stand under that self-condemnation, that the memory of the gospel of Jesus Christ will remind you that God has forgiven your sins. He has made you right with God. I love it with Corey Tenboom. She says, when I bring my sins to the Lord Jesus, he casts them into the depths of the sea, forgiven and forgotten. And he also puts up a sign, says no fishing allowed. Right? We're believing and we're hoping the gospel. We don't go past it, we go deeper in it. In our marriages, as singles, in parenting, in our griefs, in our friendship, in our church, in our work, we remember it, we hold fast to it. Now that leads to our second point. First, we see it's the power of God for salvation, but we also see that it's historical. See, this hope is not just wishful thinking for us. It is something that the Bible grounds in accurately. And this is one way that the Christian faith is different than the other world religions. Those are built on philosophy or maybe some revelation that came out. But the Christian faith is grounded in a historical event. The death and the resurrection of Jesus. Right? Really three things. His life, his death, and his resurrection. There's almost universal agreement that Jesus Christ actually lived. People might have different beliefs about what he came to do and the things that he did, but there is, uh, from the first century to the day, very little doubt that he actually lived um, in this world. There's also very little doubt that Jesus actually um, died and even died on a cross. Most people believe that he was crucified on a Roman cross. Uh, many of the early Christian or, or early non-Christian sources even testified to this. If you look at the first century, second century, they, they talk about uh, this death of Jesus upon the cross. 
And verse 4, though, speaks of this third thing, and it's the resurrection. And that's where a number of the doubts. But the Bible is clear that this is an actual historical event that we could look back, if we were to tr- time travel back, that we would be there and to see a, a, the resurrection of Jesus if you were at the tomb on that Sunday morning. If you were to take a picture there or ro- roll a video film, that you would see him rising from the dead. The liberal theologians have, have pushed the idea that the resurrection was metaphorical. Others have pushed the idea that, that um, maybe the disciples stole the body or he, or he um, faked his death and he snuck out later. Um, that certainly is, is not the story of the Bible, which stresses the historicity of this resurrection. So, you know, with those objections, uh, you know, what do we believe that the resurrection actually happened? Well, here's four reasons why I believe that the resurrection actually happened. First of all, you know, we have the testimony that Jesus was buried in a secure location. After he died, um, he was placed in a tomb and a seal was placed over that tomb, and guards were placed there. There was fear among the um, Roman leaders at that time that somebody would try to come and steal his body. So they posted guards there, and the guards had the threat of death that was over them. There was no way his body could have been stolen under, those, um, under that situation. Certainly not by the disciples, who really had no resources to them, um, but not by anybody else. His body may have been secure from being stolen, but it was not secure from the miracle of the resurrection. So we see it was secure. The second thing that we have, the second bit of evidence, is the empty tomb. When Jesus' followers uh, went to the tomb the next day, uh, it was empty. There There was no body that was in the grave. No body was produced then, and no body of Jesus has ever been produced since. There are no bones. And the lack of a body is something that has been a conundrum for, for skeptics from the beginning. Because where did it go? The Bible's clear that Jesus literally bodily rose from the dead. The third bit of historical evidence is the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. We can see some of them described in 1 Corinthians 15. If you look at verse 5, we'll see a list of this. It says in verse 5 that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. One of the reasons the Apostle Paul puts together a list like this is to show just how many people saw it. There was eyewitness testimony that was available. You can ask these people about what happened. It isn't something that happened in secret. It wasn't a hallucination. It wasn't a collusion of a few people to say something. No, this was something that there were eyewitnesses, um, too many eyewitnesses to be collusion or, or a deception. They saw it with their own eyes, and it led them to faith. We can remember the story of the Apostle Thomas. Just as, um, yeah, he's one of the apostles, but think about compounding this 500 times. The Apostle Thomas doubted the resurrection of Jesus because he didn't see it on that first day when he rose. He wasn't there with the initial uh, group of, of, of the other 10 apostles at the time. We read this in John chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Resurrected, right? But he said to them, unless I see his hands in the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, so that's the apostle uh, Thomas's experience, and he cries out, My Lord and my God. You know, multiply that by 500 people. They saw Jesus die, and they saw him raised again from the dead. It wasn't mass solution, wasn't a vision, wasn't a metaphorical story. It was the actual bodily resurrection of Jesus. The fourth bit of evidence there is the transformation of the apostles. The transformation of the apostles and all those who saw him. 
one of the most convincing arguments that I've read about in this case is one that Charles Colson wrote in his book, uh, Loving God, and he recounts the unraveling of the Watergate scandal. Again, Charles Colson was part of the Nixon administration, and, and he uh, was part of the Watergate um, crimes that took place, and, and he, as, as you know, some of the, the hints of the story began to, to come out, he thought, well, you know, as long as we all keep our secret together, we're all going to be safe. We'll just keep the secret. As long as nobody spills the beans, you know, nobody's going to get in trouble and nobody's going to go to jail. And there was this kind of pact that went, um, you know, that they could protect each other, to be safe from prosecution in jail. Well, the book, uh, he, he describes how it took almost no time for their story to unravel with the threat of jail time that was ahead, with, with the thought of plea bargaining or reduced sentencing. Uh, among certain people that they, people began squealing on each other. Their, their lie and their crime unraveled very quickly. Now, if we go to the story of the apostles, we see nothing like this ever happened in the disciples. You know, they continued to profess faith in Jesus Christ even when it meant that they would be persecuted. Even under the threat of death, the thought of torture, it wouldn't convince them of anything other than Jesus Christ was really raised from the dead. I mean, this truth was part of their lives, more, truth, more true than their life itself. It reduced that fear that they had. It overrode that fear in their testimony. Colson goes on to say that no one would ever die for a known lie. No one will die for a known lie. They, they won't even go to jail for a known lie, was his point. They won't die for a known lie, but will die for something we know to be true. Every one of the apostles suffered for their faith. Um, every one of them could have given up, saying it was a lie, just to spare themselves of suffering and even death. Only Apostle Paul, only Apostle John, do we think, was uh, lived uh, and not being killed at the end of his life, d- dying a natural death, but the stories are that even he was boiled in oil um, or dipped in some oil. Even the Apostle Thomas, who we read about here just a minute ago, that uh, we... Uh, b- you know, we're told that he went to India and where he was persecuted and even died for his faith out there. You see, if the resurrection happened, it really changes everything. You know, seriously, if, if it happened, you need it. It's, it's the, the single fact that convinced me of the truth of the Christian faith. You know, the resurrection gives weight to the message of the gospel because if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we need to take his word very seriously. That's why we're not afraid, ashamed to speak about it. And as we're talking to people about their faith, I, I want them to, number one, be reading the Bible and, and coming face to face with Jesus himself. But number two, I'm going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Because as that comes into focus, the historical fact of it and how it works its way out in faith, um, everything else falls in place. We have books out in the foyer. If you want to know more about speaking about the resurrection and defending the resurrection or, or, or why we should and can believe that, we have books in the foyer available if you'd like to pick one up. Now, one of the ones who's changed in this was the Apostle Paul. And we see that in verses 9 through 11. That brings us to our third point where we see how the gospel transforms. Starting in verse 9, we read this. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed." One of the things we see when we look at these verses is the grace of God that can transform any life, even the worst of sinners. You know, Paul here was a persecutor of the church, and why would Jesus come and to save his arch enemy? That's exactly what he did. And he changed Paul. It's this reminder to us that no matter what you have done, Jesus can forgive you, and, and Jesus can make you new again, make you into a new creation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. And not only did God's grace forgive his sins, but it also made him into an apostle. And one day, he changed from the greatest uh, obstacle, the greatest persecutor of the church, into his greatest messenger. And we see this change. Paul wasn't trying to be something that he wasn't. No, he was fully embracing what God had called him to do. 
That's what happens when we know the grace of Jesus Christ. We, we embrace it of, 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 as our own. And that God makes us into what we're truly designed to be. And there ought to be a lot of sat- satisfaction in that. When we know that we are where we are by the grace of God, and we know that he is making us into what he wants us to be. Now notice what he says there. He says he worked harder than the rest of them. You see, the grace of God does call us to work. That same zeal that the Apostle Paul brought to his persecutions is the same zeal that he brought when he was an apostle in making Jesus known. It's amazing what God did in him. Without the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't have a third of the New Testament. We wouldn't have the book of Romans. Who knows how the gospel would have spread without him. But now, with God, with this object of his grace, being, being Paul the apostle here, uh, God used him and used that personality in order to make the truth of Jesus Christ known throughout that, the known world at the time. But he had to work hard. We mustn't think that the Christian life is no work. It, it is work. It's, it's hard work. But it's rewarding work. It's, it, it's work that satisfies the conscience. It's work that we know is grounded in purpose. It's work that we know is rewarded inside of heaven. It's not work that we do to earn something from God. It is work that enjoys what we already know. It's not hard to do things um, for something that we enjoy. If we're going to go on a vacation, it's a lot of work to get ready for it, but we don't really think of that, right? Because it's worth it. Because we get to do something enjoyable, and in the same way, the work we do in service to the Lord it's challenging, it's hard, but it's worth it. Remember, the gospel is not just a diving board, it's the pool that we swim in, and as we go deeper, it changes us. As we go back to our daily lives as parents, as children, in the workplace, at the home, we go as witnesses to the world that the gospel of Jesus Christ changes people. It changes lives. It gives hope. It's a promise that our sins are forgiven. Helps us forgive others. Makes us more gentle, merciful, and patient with the mistakes of others. Partly because we have seen so many of our own weaknesses, so many of our own sins. We have a promise that we shall be resurrected from the dead. So we look towards the hope, toward, toward, towards the future with hope. The resurrection makes us more loving because we're entering, willing to enter in the death and resurrection of Jesus, choosing difficulty, choosing suffering. Choosing self-sacrifice, fully confident that God himself will resurrect our hope. So the gospel tells us the good news that we're way more sinful than we can imagine, but we're more loved than we can possibly comprehend. That's what we have in the gospel. It's the story of God's grace. Receive it. Stand in it. It's the power of God for salvation the power of God for your salvation, for your transformation. It is the power of God which is rooted inside of history. If you haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in the gospel. Make today the day of your salvation. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, indeed, we are more sinful than we know, but we are more loved than we can imagine. What good news that we have um, heard in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you have conquered sin through Jesus. Father, we don't have to bear the punishment of sin but he takes it away. Father, we have this gospel. We're brought into a new kingdom. God, brought out of this world with its temporality, with its baseness and sin and evil. Father, bringing us into a new kingdom, the kingdom of your beloved son. Father, help us to believe this gospel and help us to stand in the gospel as we address life's problems, as we do that by your power. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing hymn number 481. Hymn 481. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Let me just encourage you, before you leave your spot, please take a minute, greet the people around you, uh, welcome them. I'll, I'll be out back. I think Pastor Doug will be out there. Please uh, stop by and greet us on the way out. But just uh, take a minute, maybe meet somebody new, somebody you haven't seen in a while, and greet them and um, just encourage one another in the Lord. Remember this, New Life in Christ Church, that you go nowhere by accident, but you bring the Lord Christ with you wherever you go. You are a witness, Tim, as you're sent out in the world. Receive the benediction of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you, give you his peace. Amen.